morning. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, and if you are new to Burnside, we just want to, hopefully you've been made um, especially welcome here this morning with us. Uh, Mark is back with us, which is great to, to see him. And, and uh, um, yeah. yeah, I feel like a celebrity there, Mark. Like, hey. Uh, but it's great, great to have him back with us this morning. And, and uh, um, hopefully he'll be up here next week um, preaching and, and everything. And but continue to pray for him as he, as he heals um, and, and gets his energy back from COVID. Um, you know, it, we're, we're at this, this final stages of Jesus' life and, and ministry here on earth as we continue to, to walk through the book of John. Um, and today we're going to be in John chapter 13, starting in verse 31. Um, and these next several chapters are, are going to take place, um, there's a lot of instruction in there, but it's going to take place over a short amount of time. Uh, as, as if you've been with us for any amount of time, you know that we are at the kind of the last night of Jesus' life. Um, when he's with his followers. Uh, they've, they've just had the Passover meal. They're in the process of having the Passover meal. Um, and he begins to, to give them instructions. You know, when I was in Bible college, um, I was not the best student out there um, until after I got, well, until after I started hanging out with Sarah, um, actually, uh, because Sarah was always in the library um, for some reason. And um, if I wanted to be around her, I had to go to the library too. And if I was going to be in the library, I might as well do my schoolwork, right? And so my grades um, went way up after, after uh, starting to hang around Sarah a little bit. Um, but I, as, I, as I've reflected on my, my five years there, and yes, it takes some of us a little bit longer, um, I called it my victory lap, my fifth year. Some people call it a super senior. But as I reflect on that, and I think about the times where, where I, I got to learn just from some amazing men and women, um, who are great theologians and, and just wonderful people. I, I look back and, and I think, can't help but think sometimes I may have wasted the time that I had. And some of the instruction that they, that they shared and, and some of the life lessons that they've shared with us as, as students over the time, there's some that, that I, I hold dear and I, and I remember um, at different moments for different reasons. And, and I think that, um, you know, as the disciples are, are walking through this last night with Jesus, as, as he's laying out the instructions, I really feel like John just kind of soaked in these moments um, and, and these final instructions. And, and, and when someone gives you kind of some final instructions as a thing, it's, it's, it's almost like you better pay attention. And, and this is kind of where we find ourselves this morning. And in John chapter 13, starting in verse 31, I might help if I turn this on. In John chapter 13, starting in verse 31, uh, there we go. It says that when he, he had left, that means Judas, when Judas had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And so here we are. Judas has just been dismissed by Jesus um, after he told John who the one to betray him would be. And Judas gets up and leaves from the Passover meal, and none of the other disciples really know what's going on. And some people argue that this next story, this, this story we just read, takes place after Jesus said, you know, we've, we've had the Lord's Supper and, and he instituted that. Some say it's before. We don't really know for sure according to John's Gospel because John doesn't actually record that taking place. Regardless, Jesus has just recently served the disciples by washing their feet and encouraging them. And now as they move forward into the night, Jesus is going to continue to offer encouragement, warnings, and some final instructions, and the first being to love. Jesus claims here that he will be glorified in God. In other words, God is about to be manifested in Jesus. See, God is the source of glory. Not all the things that Jesus has done up to this point, but God is that source. You know, glory is kind of one of those words that we throw around a lot as Christians and, and theologians, and, and while I think we have an idea of what that means, I think sometimes we use that word and we don't really think twice about it. We don't stop and really think about what we're, we're saying. It, glory in the original Greek means to praise enthusiastically. It means to magnify or celebrate. It can also mean to bring someone honor. 
And so as Jesus is saying that God is going to be glorified in the Son, and that the Son is also glorified, what Jesus is saying is that because of their close relationship, what Jesus is going to do and what he's done up to this point and all those things are going to bring enthusiastic praise to God. It means that God will be magnified by Jesus. And likewise, Jesus will be celebrated and brought to a place of honor. And not because he's seeking his own desires, mind you, but because he is submitting himself to the Father. And the question is, is how is Jesus going to be glorified? Now, if we look at what's about to take place, we, we see that Jesus in the very near future is going to die on the cross. And so is it the death of Jesus that brings about the glory of God? The, how is death glorified? And if you've been around death for any amount of time, you know that death itself does not elevate God. It cannot magnify him. But with Jesus, everything is different. See, with Jesus, death is not the end. It isn't simply the, the death of Jesus that brings about the glory of God, but rather it's through the death, the resurrection, and later the ascension of Jesus into heaven that glorifies him. Mark Moore puts it this way. He says, The, the world viewed the crucifixion as Jesus' demise, but Jesus views it as his defining need. The cross will be the beginning of Jesus' glory to glorification. So God is glorified because of the obedience of Jesus. God is manifested in Jesus because of his humility, his service, and his self-sacrifice. These things are, are fulfilled in the, per, the person of Jesus. And, and the fulfillment of all the prophecy leading up to this point, the life, that Jesus, the life and the death that Jesus has and the resurrection brings all the results and praise for the Father. Jesus brings honor to the Father, and in turn, God honors him because he accomplishes the plans that God had set out long before. And so the question is, how does your life honor God? What self-sacrifice have you willingly made to bring God and, and to bring praise to God? In what ways do our lives magnify God? You know, in this world, we're constantly bombarded with, with messages to, to, to live for ourselves, things like be true to yourself. But the, but the life of Jesus, the life that brought honor to God, and the life that elevates God, is one that requires us to look at what we have and what we do, and we ask ourselves, what do I need to give up in order to bring glory to God? What do I need to give up? What do I need to get rid of? And Jesus puts it this way in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, when he says to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Self-sacrifice is the life of the true follower of Jesus. Self-sacrifice is the life of the true follower of Jesus. Jesus tells them this because he knows that he is leaving them soon. They cannot go with him, but they will need to, to remember what he is doing and what, why he's doing it. It's all for the glory of God. It's all for the elevation of the Father. He also knows that they're going to need each other more than anything here in just a few moments, and, and that's why he gives them this new command. In verse 34, he says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And see, I read this and I say, is love, is love really a new command? How is this a new command? Jesus has already talked about loving other people and loving your neighbor and, and everything. In fact, love for one another is embedded in the Old Testament law. So what is different? What is different in, in what Jesus is commanding here? Because Leviticus 19 says, Do not take revenge or bear grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The difference is that Christian love is different. The law taught to love the fellow Jew just as often there's affection for family and how it differs between the kindness to a neighbor. Jesus commands us to love regardless of heritage. See, Jesus' love is, is entirely new. The newness of the command is that they love one another as he has loved them. And, and how has he done that? He's done that through constant self-sacrificing love. And so that constant self-sacrificing love must become the pattern for our own lives. It must become the pattern for our attitudes and the way in which we relate to one another. See, 
we love, so we see that love is not new, but the way in which it's carried out is. This love that Jesus talks about, and, and the word he uses is agape, and it is the strongest form of love, one without conditions. And Jesus wants his followers, you and me included, to keep on loving one another just as he does. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another, Jesus says. Just as he does. And, and, and that is the measure of our love for one another. The measure of our love for one another is set by Christ's love for us. Regardless of who we are or regardless of, of, of who we come into contact with, regardless of whether or not we like somebody, we're called to love them. And how did he love us? He loved us in, in Romans 5. It says, For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Before we were born, before we ever stepped foot in a church, before we even knew we needed salvation, Christ died for us. Jesus loved us by dying for us even when we least deserved it. And when was the last time you and I loved other Christians even when they don't deserve it? Even when they, they treat us poorly? Even when we have arguments? When was the last time that we self-sacrificed for the benefit of someone else? And that's the kind of love that Jesus' example is, and that is the love that should mark our lives. John, in, in his epistles, in 1 John, he writes in verse three, six, or chapter 3, verse six, 16, this is how we have come to know love. This is how we even know what love is, he says, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I just want to let that sink in for a minute. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. See, Jesus tells us that the world will know that we are his followers by the love that we show one another. In the way that you and I show our love to, to one another, people will know who we follow. Likewise, the opposite is true. The way that, in which we withhold our love from one, other, from one another is also proving of who we do not follow. And so if we withhold our love from one another, are we really following Jesus, who commands us to, to show our love to one another? One of the early church fathers in, in, in 197 AD, his name was Tertullian, and he wrote a, kind of a defense of, of the Christian faith called the Apology, Apology meaning defense, and in it he wrote these words, But it is mainly deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. See, they say, how they love one another. For themselves are animated by mutual hatred. How they are ready even to die for one another, for they themselves will sooner put to death. He continues on and says, And they are angry with us too, because we call each other brethren for no other reason, as I think, than because among themselves names a consanguinity are assumed in mere pay, uh, pretense of affection. And so Tertullian is echoing the words of Christ here by saying that love is the proof of being a disciple. And people notice the way that we take care of one another. Hatred of one another is an argument that we are not disciples of Jesus. And so what markers do we usually use for a Christian? When we refer to someone as being strong in, in their faith, they're a strong Christian, what would you say? They go to church regularly? They give a tithe? They serve faithfully? Maybe they're an elder or a deacon or they stand up in front of people and preach? Certain Christian acts and rituals, the habits that we have, the way someone dresses or the way someone speaks, the customs we hold to do not show nor prove our discipleship. We can read our Bible every day. We can pray. We can teach Sunday school. We can preach from the pulpit. We can serve in, in, in numerous ways. None of those shows nor proves our discipleship. Rather, it is the deep genuine and tender affection that you and I have for one another that shows our faith and proves that we are followers of Jesus because we cannot fake love. We, we cannot fake love. We can get up in front of somebody and we can preach all day long and we can, we can fake being a Christian, but we cannot fake love. And, and so what does your life reflect? 
How does the way that I live show that I am a disciple of Christ? Everyone will know by the love that we have for one another, loving as Jesus has just shown us and given us an example to follow. And so continuing on into the conversation, Simon Peter speaks up. He says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? Truly I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. And so Peter skips right past the whole loving each other thing, right? He, he's hung up on the fact that Jesus is leaving. He doesn't want to go someplace. Why can't I go with you? And the way he asked that is that he expected Jesus to get up at that moment and leave the table. And Peter, at this point, he couldn't grasp the idea of Jesus' death. Claiming a great faith, Peter is unaware of his own weaknesses that are about to be exploited. And in his mind, Peter thinks he can go to the limit, even to the point of death. Eventually, his faith in Jesus will cost him his life, as, as, we, as we know, but, but at this point, it's not, that, it's not there yet. And there's no way for him to understand where Jesus is going. But being this close to Jesus and being this close to the inauguration of a new kingdom that he's been looking forward to his entire life, the one that Jesus came to establish, Peter was not about to let it slip away from him. And so he boldly claims his dedication, even though it is about to be tested. Peter offers his life, but little did he know that Peter would not be laying down his life for Jesus, but Jesus will be laying down his own life for Peter. And so Jesus declares that the definitive mark of believers is that they love others with a selfless love. And we do not show love by a grandiose statement as, as Peter has just done about his own faith, but rather we show it in practical ways. And so I want to talk to you here just a moment as we, as we talk about this. What are some practical ways you can show other people love? There's a book called The Five Love Language by um, Gary Chapman, and, and, and these principles are from that book. And so if you've read it, this will be a refresher for you. And if not, this will be a primer for you to, to go and, and maybe even read the book for yourself. But there are five ways in which we can show love. The first is through encouraging words. Telling someone how much you appreciate them. Building them up with your words. Communicating regularly through text, email, phone calls. Writing someone a letter. These are all ways to show someone that you love them and appreciate them. You know, this past month was Pastor Appreciation Month, and I, as well as other staff members, received several cards from, from you. And those notes, they, they build us up. In fact, I have two, um, I still have two of the most meaningful notes I've, I've ever received in my time in ministry. They were both from former students of mine while doing student ministry. And, and in it, these students encouraged me by telling me how much I meant to them and, and, and how much I, I've helped them along the way. They spoke about the relationship that we shared. And that is a simple yet profound way for us to share our affection towards one another. And so I, I encourage you, to, to, as you show love to, to one another, do so through encouraging words. Writing somebody a note, picking up the phone, sending a text. The next way is through quality time. In today's world, we're constantly pulled in many different directions. There are so many things that are vying for our attention. And it seems to be rare when we have moments where we gain someone's undivided attention. But doing that shows how much we value the other person. Actively listening. Actually paying attention to what the person is saying and not just nodding our heads. Making eye contact and being fully present shows the person that we are talking to that they are valued and loved. The third is, is acts of service. In Ephesians 5.21, Paul talks about this. He says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Paul tells us to submit to one another. It's sacrificing for one another. Do things for each other. And we, we watched a video um, about Operation Christmas Child and it talked about the importance of serving other people. When we go out of our way to make life easier for someone else, we show love. When we go out of our way to do things for somebody else, we show love because actions speak louder than words. I like what, what Andy Stanley says about, about Ephesians 5.21. 
He says that it's a submission competition, that we seek out ways to serve one another rather than looking to be served. And what are ways that you can serve people within the church? You know, what skill set do you have? Maybe you can help rake their leaves, take them a meal, change their oil, clean their gutters, clean their house, give them a ride to the doctor's office. What are ways that you can serve other people? What skill set and what gifting do you have that God has gifted you with? Because I believe he's given all of us gifts and abilities. And he didn't give those for ourselves, but he gave gave them to us so we could build one another up. The fourth one is, is gifts. And this one's pretty straightforward. Gifts are basically uh, visual symbols of love. And it's not about the monetary value of the gift, but the symbolic gesture behind it. Careful reflection, deliberate choosing. It was that the individual is known and loved. And I think we've probably all received gifts before. When you open it up and you look at it and you just fake a smile because you're like, this person doesn't know me at all. I would never really want this, right? But then there's times where we've received gifts and we open it up and, and we, we just wonder, like, how did you know that I would want something like this? How, how did you know me so well in that moment? Last spring on March 14th, it was, it was it's called High Day, and I shared with you, um, I don't remember if I was preaching or just doing announcements, um, that my favorite pie was, was a blueberry pie. And one of you here, and you know who you are, went home that afternoon and made me a pie and delivered it to me the next day. And I quickly ate that in, in no time whatsoever. And let me tell you, I felt loved at that moment. Now, if you want to show me more love, I also like apple pie, pumpkin pie. <laughs> <laughs> All joking aside, though, when, when we thoughtfully give someone a gift, we show that they are known and loved. And one thing I love about out in, the, out in the fellowship hall, you can see there's a table for sisters in Christ. And there's always gifts on that table. And if you're a part of that, or if you want to be a part of that, you, you can just sign up for that. Um, but it, it's just wonderful to see you guys giving each other gifts thoughtfully in that manner. And the last way is that of touch. Some people love to give hugs. I am not one of them, but my son Jairus is. As many of you probably know, because he comes in and and he seems to greet everybody, he comes in contact with a hug, whether you want it or not. Um, It helps, it makes you feel loved. When I come home from from work or um, just doing something, uh, most of the time my boys run to the door and they scream, Dad, and they just want to give me, give me hugs. And I feel loved in those moments. Sometimes all someone needs is a hand on their shoulder or a hug to know and feel that they are loved. The thing is, though, that not everyone feels comfortable receiving those. And so we have to be careful and respect people's boundaries because done in a right and in a healthy way that is welcomed by the person receiving, it shows someone that you care for them. We are called to love one another as Jesus has loved us. You know, he laid down his life, self-sacrificing, so that you and I can live. And we must learn to do the same toward others, placing others' needs before our own desires. And I look at these five ways, and I see that Jesus loved in each of these ways. First, he encouraged his disciples with words. You can read that throughout the Gospels. He spent time with them over a three-year period, and this night, He focuses in on his closest closest friends and followers. He served them just just a short time ago by washing their feet. He gives the gift of eternal life. And we see that he touches the untouchable. He reaches out and touches lepers. And maybe today, maybe today you need this kind of love. Maybe today you've, you've been here or you've been, you've been going through life and you've never experienced the love that Jesus offers. I would encourage you, as, in a, here in a few minutes we're going to sing a, a song of decision. I would encourage you, as, as the, there will be a couple of elders down front, I encourage you to come down and meet with them and pray with them. Maybe today you want to publicly declare that you are a part of this church here at Burnside Christian Church because you want to be a part of this family and this community of believers. We would love to talk with you about what that means and the responsibility that that carries as well. So will you pray with me as the praise team comes forward?
Almighty God, we just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy in our lives. We thank you for um, just the love that you have shared through your Son, that, that while we were sinners, before we knew you, before we, we even knew to accept you in our lives, before we knew to trust you with that, that you died for us. You didn't die for us only, but you died for the entire world. And so I pray that we take that message of love and reconciliation into the world. But as we do, we don't, we don't walk all over people, but rather we show love so that you are glorified, so that you are magnified and celebrated and honored through our lives, Father. Can you tell us, God, that, that people will know that we are your, your Christians, that we are, are your followers by the love that we share? And I pray that the love that we show is a light to this world. Thank you for all that you do in our lives. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.